Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Meto Kowalski, and I'm the president of the United Macedonian Diaspora. Um, I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. I hope everybody can see uh, my, my background. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight for this virtual hour with Mario Christovski from Mario's History Talks. Um, the topic is Beat the Boredom, 10 Things You Can Pick Up Right Now to Learn About Macedonia. Um, just a few uh, logistical matters. Um, everybody is on mute. Um, Mario is going to start speaking in, in a minute or so. And uh, this event is recorded that will then uh, be put on uh, Facebook and YouTube, uh, just so you're aware. If you have any questions um, for Mario, please put them in the chat um, and then we'll ask him one by one. Um, and so with that, um, just so you know some background about Mario, and I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about himself. Um, he is originally uh, from Bitola, born in Bitola. Um, he was chairman of Generation M, which is UMD's Young Leaders uh, Program. And in 2015, uh, actually was our International Policy and Diplomacy Fellow in Washington, D.C. And so we're really pleased that Mario um, is involved uh, with uh, UMD and Generation M and uh, his popular uh, YouTube uh, show called Mario's History Talks uh, is now on uh, Zoom virtual event. Uh, I wish we could do these in person, but as they say, um, next time, uh, hopefully in person. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mario to begin his talk. Hi, everybody. Can uh, you all hear me? Fantastic. Uh, great to see so many uh, happy, smiling, albeit little bored faces during the quarantine here. Um, I'm very honored that you chose to spend uh, your hour on Thursdays with me. So i um, do my best to keep you entertained here and uh, show you some stuff I think would be pretty interesting. Um, stuff you probably won't be able to uh, pick up on your own. It's completely fine. A little bit of background about myself. Uh, Mitzel did a really good job. Um, from Macedonia originally, born in Bitola, um, come from a very uh, patriotic family, so I was always kind of um, in that environment. In fact, I like to think um, uh, my first steps as, as a baby um, kind of landed on the Greek's last nerve, so I've already kind of uh, had that just from growing up. So I've just um, started where you were once. I didn't really know much about Macedonia, just wanted to know more and more. In fact, I saw the movie um, Alexander, if a lot of you have seen it. Don't worry, I'm not going to be talking about that. It's going to be a little bit more of a, a niche collection we're going to talk about tonight. So I want to know more about Macedonia and my history and see what's accurate, what's fair, and um, do we have a stake to who we say we are? So um, it's going to be a nice little cozy session tonight, nothing really formal. I'm going to show you some things I think are pretty cool. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to just shoot in the chat, and we can talk a little afterwards as well. But uh, we'll do the best to fill the time here, and um, like I said, I'll get you started on a... Uh, on a path to learning about Macedonia. Um, we have a lot of time now, so uh, this is something you're passionate about. Um, if you don't start now, I would say uh, lack of time really wasn't the issue in, before this. It's, it's always about discipline. So I think this would be a good opportunity for a lot of us. So um, let's, let's get started. So I've um, seen a lot of you at a convention and uh, a lot of Macedonian events and uh, a lot of the things that do connect us besides, you know, Baba's cooking and the kebapi. Um, one of the things that connect us is the music. Uh, Massing music does go back centuries, and in those songs, there's stories. I mean, we have songs about lovers, we have songs about tragedy, we have songs about battles. Every song out there had to have, something had to have happened for that to um, be transcribed. And during the Ottoman Empire, um, news couldn't be spread. I mean, there was a strict enforcement. I mean, you can tell stories about heroes or what was happening, they did it through music. They did it through coded language and music. So that's how they were able to pass on traditions from, gener from generation to generation, stories, heroes, and preserve this crazy little thing called our Macedonian identity through this oral tradition. Um, if you look at that in ancient times, I mean, that's exactly how it happened. And uh, in the Balkans, there's a bit of a continuity 
in terms of that oral tradition. So a lot of the songs that we do sing, um, we know them, but we don't actually fully, um, fully understand them. So um, a resource I do heavily recommend is a website that you can go on to right now called pisna.org. I'm going to show you exactly what that is here. Just give me one moment. So I'm going to do some uh, screen sharing here. It's going to be a little fun. All right, so hopefully you guys see my screen here. Um, this is the main page of pisna.org. So what this is, is this is a folklorist out of Ohit, basically compiles probably the largest um, collection of Macedonian folk songs on the internet. Um, you can see here they have lyrics to audios to translations. What's cool about this site is um, basically, A, you can download any song you want for free. It's all, none of it is charged. It's out of the goodness of uh, this person's heart that he's doing this. But secondly, you also are able to read these songs in your language. By that I mean a lot of them are translated in English. A lot of them are translated in Greek. A lot are translated in German. So it's one thing to hear the song in a bit of archaic Macedonian. I mean, how, how many of us still know what Aber means? Aber mistigna. Aber means news. No, nobody understands that nowadays. So when you're able to actually translate the songs and read them in your own language and kind of see some background on it as well, um, you're able to get a really fresh appreciation of the songs and uh, what they have to offer at the end of the day. So um, if you look here, you have a lot of the... Uh, performers here, but um, let's look at just the translation here. Um, let's try this. This is just German. So um, you can see here they have them all in beautiful uh, translation. These are professionals that do it, but a um, little bit of a self-promotion here. Among the many things I did in college, I actually translate a lot of these songs myself. So that's my ugly face there, but uh, Here's some of the most popular songs here that are translated. Um, so you can actually kind of understand what's going on, what's important. So um, here's a song about the death of Gota Dolce. Um, very archaic Macedonian here, but you go here, you kind of translate it, and you can get a feel for the song, feel what's going on. It's very emotional um, imprint in our identity, our folk music. I think it's honestly the strongest uh, link that we do have to our past and to our identity. So let me just stop sharing that. So I encourage you to go there, find some songs that you know, but also find some songs you don't know. I mean, that's really where the fun of this is. Find some songs you don't know. Look at, look at the translations that are available, and you'll be able to actually start picking up the pieces of what's actually happening. There's actually some uh, footnotes there as well that you can also pick up on. So if you have any further questions, um, well, you know me, so uh, you're able to reach out to me and uh, if you have any questions about that. But um, go past Stani Moment. Go past the Beast of the Balkan. So that's my challenge to you. There's so much deeper stuff out there. Songs about battle, songs about individuals whose only imprint on this earth is a reference in the song. That's their only connection to us. And we're able to hear what happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. To me, that's phenomenal. So I um, encourage you to go to pisslon.org, have some fun with it, I'm not doing anything, just put on some music, you can pick about it and learn about it later. So um, that's the first thing I do want to talk about is our common link to that. So secondly, for those of us that are a little bit more um, bookish and studious, I do have a couple of books I also do recommend that I think um, give an interesting, although let's say controversial approach to the Macedonian history. So the first book I'm going to talk about is this book right here. I don't know if you can see that. It's called Confessions of a Macedonian Bandit. Um, first, you can see it's actually pretty short. You can probably do this in a one, one quarantine sitting. You easily finish it. Now, what it's about is it's an American journalist who um, traveled to Europe in 1904 and while there actually allowed himself to be kidnapped by the Macedonian bandits, the Komiti. And he traveled with them for about two weeks while being kidnapped, even though it was planned. And he's able to tell us exactly what he was seeing. He went to Volden, he went to Bitola, he went to the Presmus Gezera. He met the Komiti, he met the famous people, he met Dame Gruev, he met a lot of famous people. So you're seeing that through an American's perspective. He's more of like a, a journalist and an adventurer than anything. So you're able to see a lot of interesting stuff through that um, kind of fresh perspective that you really wouldn't see anywhere else. Now I'm gonna tell you about this book. It's definitely worth picking up because you'll see two things. First, you'll see that throughout most of our history, organization has been our biggest problem. As much as we idealize Vamoro, um, they were pretty disorganized. Um, Seeing here, it's uh, called Confessions of a Macedonian Bandit, the name of the book. I'll put it in the link as well. Um, 
Vomoto and all the rebels, they were very disorganized. They really didn't have much of a set objective. It was at times a free-for-all, and at worst, it was anarchy. So you get a fresh appreciation of exactly what our problems are and how to combat them moving forward. It's been a plague on the mass of people for much too long. And you're able to see this here. It's very raw and unfiltered. But I do caution you. If you're new to the mass in history, this may not be the book for you. Why? This book is a product of our times. The way they look at the mass of people, the author, the way he describes them is not something we would be comfortable with. He calls them Bulgarians. He says they are Bulgarians, and that's pretty much what he was told. That's what he expected being a foreign journalist. Our identity was still not fully formed at the time. Most Macedonians didn't even know the concept of identity. To them, they were just Christians. They were just Orthodox. It was not something that it only happens in developed countries. So if you're able to swallow that and realize it is a, it's a product of its time, it doesn't reflect what's actually true or accurate about our identity, Really, really great book. Now, the second book I do recommend, again, in that same ilk, the book, uh, if you are able to stomach um, stuff that's uncomfortable about your identity, that's a little bit biased, and you're able to go past that, really good information. That second book, book is called Freedom or Death, The Life of Gwotsa Bilchev. So that is written by a British historian named Mersha McDermott. Now, what's unfortunate about Mersha is she was a paid agent of the Bulgarian state. That book is, without a doubt, one of the biggest pieces of Bulgarian propaganda ever. In fact, in the 70s, the Bulgarian politicians were giving as gifts to diplomats to convince the world that Gotsadolchev was Bulgarian. Absolutely absurd. But the book itself is actually so quite valuable. It is the most extensively researched, detailed biography of Gotsadolchev ever. If you're going to hear stuff about Gotsadolchev, who, for those of us joining that don't know who he is, he's like George Washington of the Macedonian Revolutionary Movement. You're able to see stuff that you'll never have known about him. Like, he had problems with his father. They didn't have a really good relationship. Um, he was a little bit of a shy and kind of nerdy student growing up. Um, he wasn't all that athletic. He was an intellectual. But you're also able to see exactly how his character was. So I'm actually going to read you a little bit passage from that. Now you're really able to see Gosa Dolce right in front of you. So this is um, just uh, from first-hand accounts. He would have, he'd be the first one to start talking, Gosa. While you gaze at him, delighting in him, and he would go straight to your very soul and touch its most sensitive chords. He would ask you how you are. With touch and intimacy and sympathy, they came to believe they could see everything in your soul and reacted with you in exactly the same way. And you would open your mouth. You couldn't help but trusting him. You couldn't help but telling him the things you hid from yourself even. And he would ask you about your relatives and your acquaintances, though he was sharing it all too. Meekly, imperceptibly, you would uncover your soul to him. And you would see that he participated in your experiences, and he was moved by them more often and more visibly than you were yourself. How many of you got goosebumps reading that? That's, that's, that's a side to go to Dolce if you're, you're going to be able to uncover. Like I said, it's, it's not comfortable if you know she's a Bulgarian agent, but there's some really, really good details in there. Stuff you're never even be able to uh, find otherwise. So you're able to go past that. You understand this is still biased to it. Do pick it up. It's actually available online. I'm gonna send you the link to that. Freely available. I'll get it to you. So uh, great, great book. And like I said, um, that's also a calling card. We need to we need to pick up the pace and have our own biography of Gosselin just in the English language that actually does tell the true story of who he was and why he's so important to us. So, but uh. Any, any kind of questions up until now? All right, let's keep moving. So another thing I do want to touch on is, well, twofold. The Macedonian history, first of all, does anybody know who the Monaki brothers are? I'm assuming some of you do. They're basically the pioneers of film technology in the Balkans. Um, they're the first moving footage in the Balkans. They're the ones that pioneered it. It was actually, it was actually still their grandma sewing. So that's the first ever recorded movie in the Balkans. It's their grandma selling. What I want to tell you about this is the Macedonian history is very rich in the film tradition. We started it in the Balkans. So we have a very good, strong list of movie styles. Most people don't know them, actually. Um, most people are comfortable with the modern day movies, and they're phenomenal. I love them. But there's really good movies in the 40s and 50s. And I want to talk to you about them. So um, after uh, Yugoslavia basically became the state and... Um, there was a tug of war still for the Macedonian identity, especially from Bulgarians. One of the primary um, apparatuses that was used against this propaganda was called the Vardar Film Company. And this was a state-owned entity 
but it was basically a nonstop defensive vanguard in protection of the mastering identity. So these are the ones that made movies about the mastering heroes, about the battles, the history of the mastering people, just to strengthen the idea that, hey, Macedonians are not Greeks, they're not Bulgarians, they're not Serbians, they are Macedonians. And uh, those actually caused a lot of friction with the Bulgarians because these movies were very, very effective. And in fact, not only movies, but they also produced uh, documentaries about the beauties of Macedonia in English, in French, in Spanish. They had a wide, wide audience, and they were very effective in what they were doing. So one of the movies I do want to recommend to you is a movie called The Republican Flames. So what that movie is, it's um, shot, I believe, um, I believe in the 60s to 70s. It's about the uh, days of the Indian Republic, the Khrushchev Republic, which is the first uh, modern republic uh, in the Balkans um, that only lasted for about 10 days, heroic and noble. But you're able to see it now for yourself. So I'm going to show you just a quick clip of it. You may not be able to hear the sound, but uh, that's all right. You'll be able to see some of the action. And what's great about it? English subtitles. There's English subtitles there. So you not only learn Macedonian, but you learn a little bit of history too. So let's take you. So I know I kind of teased you there, but it's a really good movie. A lot of action, really well filmed, good actors. You see Peter Guli, uh, you see Nikola Karas, and you see the desperation of these men that by the end of it, I mean, we all know what happens. They knew they were going to die defending this idea of an independent Macedonia. And the last scene is probably one of the most emotional things you're ever going to see on, TV, on, on, on the screen. So I highly encourage you to check it out. Next time you're at the Indian Dance, you're going to be so much more the better for it knowing what Eating Then was actually about. Very, very good movie. So, um, and uh, while you're at it, actually check out Vardar Film Company as well. Good documentaries about cities throughout Macedonia. You understand why they were so important and why um, they were uh, an integral piece in protecting our identity. Um, as we are today online, they were doing it through movies. So great movie there. All right, moving right along here. I'm actually going to go to another book now. Uh, this book, a little bit thicker. But that's all right. We have nothing but time in front of us. This book is called Macedonia and the Macedonians, a History. This is by an uh, author named Andrew Rosas. He's actually a uh, professor emeritus, I believe, in the University of Toronto. Could be wrong, but he's, he's definitely up in uh, Canada. And he is actually an Aegean Macedonian by descent. But his uh, field of research is actually Eastern Europe in general. Now, to me, this is actually probably one of the most neutral books that gets around the sticky questions about our identity in terms of why it was so fragmented and why at many times Macedonians that were saying they were fighting for Macedonia also held interest for Bulgaria, why they held interest for Greece, and why at one time a Macedonian may say, I'm only Macedonian, nothing else, and then another time you may say he's Greek or Bulgarian. It's a very fluid identity at that time period. All this be on demand in terms of what was needed of them to get the ammunition, to get the supply, to get the support, to get the money. So as complicated as our identity is, this is a very good book to kind of distilling why there's so many problems about that. And it tells you, despite what the version of history you've been told, most of it may be wrong, which is okay, because the truth is still on our side. We're still Macedonians. We, we still have descent from the original Macedonian people. Though it may be just by blood, not by culture, it's still on our side. Now, the way you may have been taught it may not be accurate, but that's okay. That's part of learning. Don't stick to your ideas until they decay. Evolve them. Make them new. Challenge them. And this book does that phenomenally well. And this book, because I love you all, on a PDF of it online, between us, I'll have a link for it for you guys available if you message me. So no worries there. I got you. Great, great book. A little bit on the thicker side, but like I said, you can pick it up. There's great sections all around. You can just pick up and uh, go from there goes from the ancient history all the way up until the breakup of Yugoslavia, actually. So for a book this size covering about 2,500 years, still pretty concise. So great, great book. And uh, it's great that it's in the chat there.
Okay, so let's go back to uh, go back to some movies now and some uh, online stuff. There is um, actually on YouTube. It's part of the the modern day Republic of Macedonia's efforts to set, to uh, solidify its identity against Greeks, Bulgarians, and what, what have you. Um, a lot of great documentaries out there. And unfortunately, for most of us, we can't really access them being in America, Canada, or Australia. Some of us can, but most of us can't. I actually did find a great, great uh, resource online. Um, it's a YouTube channel that is literally called Macedonian Documentaries. And they have a collection of all these great, great documentaries just there, freely available to all of us. So um, they're, they're about pretty much anything you can imagine, from Gota Dolcev, um, cities, history, the revolutionaries, um, the battles. They are in the Macedonian language, but they have great, great historians that actually do talk about them. Great first-hand accounts, great rare pictures that you may not have seen before. So um, honestly, a fantastic resource. Um, I'm actually just going to pull it up right here. Hopefully it's available. So I'm going to show you just a little bit about what it's like. Um, they're about 40 minutes, so not too long. Uh, definitely enjoyable, um, you know, in an evening when you're not doing much. So let me just show you a little bit about what it's like. You may not be able to hear the sound, obviously, but um, also I'm having a little connectivity problems. So yeah, there's a, like a Vomoto document, one of the early uh, early constitutions. They kind of go over all that. Um, so this one's specific about Aegean Macedonia. So this is all about the cities, um, what happens there, the revolutionaries, um, letters from Gota Delchev. There's, there's there's Gota himself. I guarantee that's a picture. Um, let me see here. Most of you haven't seen before. That that a lot of them are in there. A lot of rare photos, and uh, they have a great. Great um, offering, honestly. It's, it's a lot of stuff here. Let's see. They have a great offering. There's stuff about Olchit, Aegean Macedonia, the symbols of Macedonia, ancient Macedonia, archaeology. Um, I mean, wh whatever your flavor is, honestly, I mean, Steve, whatever your flavor is, they have a great, great resources there. So let me just uh, stop sharing. Great resources, no matter what your flavor is, and they're they're very very accessible. Nothing too dense, not going to put you to sleep. I'm I'm a fan of them, so um, definitely do check it out. There's definitely something there for you. All right, let's just see how we are on time here. We're making great time, fantastic. Well, just it's not completely unbearable. We'll make it. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look here. Okay, so let's go back and shift gears again. Uh, let's go back to uh, the Varda Film Company. And this is a movie I do want you to check out within the next couple of weeks. Now, I'm going to hold you to that. Why do I want you to check out in the next couple of weeks? Well, it's a movie about an event that took place in 1903 in late April. So the anniversary of that is coming up. And I want you to check that out. This movie is called Solunskite Atentatori, The Assassins from Salonika. Now, I'll share a Mario's History Talk video about this, but this is probably one of my most interesting topics and probably my favorite video. So, uh, a little bit of a uh, shout out there, self-promotion. Uh, check it out. On my YouTube channel, it's called uh, The Boatman of Salonika. They don't want to say assassins just for uh, YouTube's sake. Uh, it's called The Boatman of Salonika. So really brief refresher on them. Who are the Boatman of Salonika? They were a group of young, wealthy intellectuals from Venice living in Solon, Salonika, in 1903. And these men were so disillusioned by the, first of all, I'm saying men. They weren't men. They were teenagers, 19, 20 year olds. The oldest one was about 25 years old. Teenagers. Yet their love of Macedonia was so deep, and the suffering of their people just flowed through their veins, they couldn't even swallow life anymore. They couldn't take it. So they basically all vowed that they were going to attack um, strategic parts of Salonika without harming any civilians to attract the Western powers to the suffering of the Macedonians so they would intervene and help. And being young, they didn't want to live, like I said. They were so dedicated, they all vowed to give their lives for Macedonia. These young, young men. They were idealistic. They were, in a way, um, hot-headed. But they had that simplicity, that pureness of children, to look at their people, to look at their country, to realize they will do whatever was needed for them to free Macedonia and liberate it from the Turkish yoke. 
And I'm not going to ruin what happens to you, but it's a phenomenal, phenomenal movie. I'm actually going to show you a really quick clip um, from my YouTube channel, actually. What you're going to see is um, the night before their attacks. It was a three-day attack. Uh, some of their targets included a French ship, the post office, the bank, some hotels, uh, some inns. Um, the night before their attack, in the movie, it's a bit dramatized. It's not fully accurate, but it's about 80% there. Um, you're seeing them basically saying about each other. They know they're about to die. And they want to salute each other, and they want to place the importance back to Macedonia. So I'm going to show you a quick clip. You might not hear the sound, but there's subtitles, so please do uh, pay attention. I just have something in my eye there. Oh, God. It's allergies or something. Oh, boy. Um, so, uh, first of all, Goosebumps, obviously. It's a really phenomenal movie. And what's interesting about it is it kind of does show some of the ideals of, um, of Yugoslavia. I mean, for all its flaws, they were hell-bent on protecting the masculine identity from Bulgarians and Greeks. And in this movie, you actually see Serbians and Croatians acting alongside Macedonians and speaking Macedonian. It was a collective effort to show that Macedonia did not belong to anybody else but the Macedonians. And it's a phenomenally well shot movie, even for the time period, it's really well done. But um, as you guys said at the end there, if we, if we fail, one day there will become those better than us. So do um, you think that's us? Do you think that's, uh, that's our generation? It's our movement? Something to think about. They died knowing that, uh, that hope would live on. All they wanted was a flower where they died. So um, think about them. This uh, when you do watch the movie, think about these young teenagers, um, and actually check out my video too. Um, it's actually a little bit more accurate about what actually happened. Um, check out my video first, then watch the movie. And on the anniversary of their deaths, you'll see what it is. Um, just give them a passing thought. They didn't have much in this world. They didn't see old age. Um, they just gave it all for Macedonia. And think about what you're doing and how you can continue that legacy. It's a great movie. Great uh, emotional ties. Like I said, check out my video as well. You get some good historical backing on it. Like I said, it's about 80% there. So moving right along here. I think we're still good on time here. So let me just uh, close out of this. Okay. All right. So uh, we have that and um, a couple more here. So uh, with the um, advent, obviously, of the mass media, especially with the movies like this, it also became TV series that were also instrumental in the fight against um, Bulgarian propaganda. Because for the Bulgarians, when they lost Macedonia, I mean, it was just the end of the world. They fought two world wars allied with Nazis, with fascists, and they stole lost out. It was unbearable for them. So they never actually gave up hope in terms of reunifying with Macedonia. So these methods of communication, mass media, crucial to our history. And one of them was actually a series from the, um, from the 70s called Tvrdokorni, which um, by my translation is basically means uh, rough, uh, like roots like of a, of a tree or something. Um, basically means dedication. So this is like a mini series about uh, the, the various rebels and Macedonians throughout the history. Uh, it's about 30 minutes each, uh, but it tells highlights of their life. Um, sped up a little, obviously, but their major um, contributions um, what their ideals were, um, how they fought, how they died, and uh, really what their, um, what their legacy is. So I'm going to show you a quick one. It's actually about a, a man named uh, Metodi Pachev. And um, I know Philip's laughing uh, when, heard, when he heard that because uh, this is a man that we actually did visit his grave uh, while we were in, um, 
in Macedonia, actually. Um, he's buried outside of Philip. I'm not going to tell you exactly um, how he died. Obviously, I do want you to check out this uh, uh, the series. But he's actually one of the more celebrated Macedonian revolutionaries just because of his uh, heroic sacrifice um, when faced uh, against the um, incoming Ottoman forces. So let me just show you a little bit about how it's shot. And uh, you'll see what I mean. It's actually quite modern. So nice modern. It's actually a remake of a um, continuation, I should say, of the original series from the 70s. Um, what's cool about it, you really get to see how these rebels lived. I mean, their life was miserable. Um, there is an old saying about how they viewed their life. Um, basically, the roof over their head was the trees in the forest. Um, their children was, uh, was their bullets. Um, their wife was their rifle. And their mother was Macedonia. That's all they had in this world. And you really get to see how they lived here. Like I said, it's, um, it was a very Spartan lifestyle. Um, still flawed. Like I said, it wasn't all that perfect in terms of organization. But that zeal that they had for Macedonia, I mean, you're going to be able to experience that. It's modern. It's accessible. It's actually very fun. Um, I'm, not saying, I'm saying that in a light way, obviously. It's, it's an enjoyable, thoroughly action-filled series. About 30 minutes each. Start with somebody you know. Yanis Sanansky, maybe. Vasil Chikolato. Um, Start, um, start somebody you know, with somebody you know, and just go from there. And um, so Philip asked uh, which village Mitsuli Pachev was buried in. Um, I'll tell you, it's, it's around Prilip. It's a village called uh, Kadin Mosevo. Um, and I actually had to find it. It wasn't actually <laughs> on that map. That's another story for another time, actually. I, I can post something about that. And I actually talked to the villagers there. They actually still have the stories of what happened in 1903 passed on them. And they told me stuff I never would have found otherwise. So. Um, We'll talk about that another time. I actually might, might be able to do a video on that. But um, do check it out. Tell you a little bit more about that. Check out these videos first. Very accessible. Very fun. Okay. All right. So a couple more things here. In the same kind of general genre, my absolute favorite um, miniseries, probably in history. I mean, I don't want to go that far. But uh, it's a miniseries uh, produced in Yugoslavia, like I said called The Courier of Gota Now, this is made in the 70s, and this is, like I said, in part to strengthen the masculine identity. What is great about it, the actor, a man by the name of Darko Damaski, he looks like Gota I mean, you see that sparkle in his eyes. He looks like Gota He's probably one of the more accurate depictions of him I've ever seen. And this is an interesting little show. It's about this uh, student of his um, in his class who forms a bond with Gota and uh, eventually becomes his courier and slowly gets initiated into the rebels, into Vamoro, and eventually goes up to the ranks and he lives the life of a mastering freedom fighter, this little kid. You follow his story, um, having you know, being with Gotsu Dolchev there and kind of seeing it through his perspective, um, what it was like for a kid um, in that time period, going to school and giving it all up just to follow these, these men through the mountains, not knowing where me next meal is coming from or how long they have to live. Phenomenal series. So I'm going to show you a little clip. Um, goosebumps warning. This will give you goosebumps, but uh, that's what I'm here for. Now, I know you can uh, hear the audio there. I'll send you the clip, actually, here. Um, you'll be able to check it out. I just wanted you to see what he looked like. I mean, it's a phenomenal portrayal. And what he's basically saying there is, some of the students, um, my students, um, I'm going to be teaching you these subjects. And most of, uh, I know you already know Macedonian, but I'm, I'm going to be teaching you French. 
because French is the wor is the language of international diplomacy and communication. And that's the way you're going to be able to tell the world that you're Macedonians so they can hear you. So that's what he was saying there. Really phenomenal series. It shows great battle scenes, the drama of the time period. But that actor that plays Lutzevilchev, it's, it's like it's his cousin. Really close depiction. And you kind of see that warmness uh, from Gotze that really can't be described. You kind of have to experience it for yourself. So that's the Kurirot na Gotze, the courier of Gotze Gotze. Just that we're doing on time. Phenomenal time. Love it. Okay. If only uh, Corona did this, uh, this efficiently, we'd be much happier. But uh, let's keep going here. Okay. So um, you're telling a bit of a movie buff. I'm telling you a lot of movies. Um, so a lot of great movies out there that I don't think are nearly as mentioned as they should be. So this other movie that I do want to talk about, um, it's about an affair, but not in the way you're probably thinking. Um, it's called The Miss Stone Affair. Now, has anybody ever heard of The Miss Stone Affair? Some here and there? That's all right. I didn't know about it a couple of years ago. So what was The Miss Stone Affair and why you should care about it? The Miss Stone Affair was basically an attempt to kidnap a Protestant missionary from America that was traveling in Macedonia along with a group of other missionaries. Uh, Yana Sandanski, a uh, Macedonian revolutionary, who we're actually going to have a talk about um, on the 20, uh, 22nd, so do join us. Um, basically, in need of donations and money, uh, basically came up with a scheme to kill a Protestant missionary, hold her for ransom, and petition the U.S. government to loan money, to, to give money to, um, to, the, to the cause. Now, what's wasn't the woman a Mormon? I um, believe she was Protestant. Um, I can double check on that. My understanding is she was a Protestant missionary um, because during the time period, a lot of Christians seemed to think because uh, we weren't Protestant, that was why the Ottoman Empire was still on us. It was like a sin. In fact, go to Dolce, he said if, if Macedonia was Protestant, they probably would have been freed 200 years ago because they would have gotten some outside help. So kind of a humorous little anecdote there. But um, she was kidnapped. And um, two things about that that's interesting. First of all, she got a bit of a Stockholm syndrome. By the end of it, she did sympathize with Macedonia, the cause, and her kidnappers. So uh, she did see why, why this was happening. But secondly, this was the United States' first international hostage kidnapping situation ever. Macedonia baptized the United States in its international diplomacy, in its hostage situations, with this little Protestant missionary along with her group. So this is actually in the State Department. Um, you can actually look at their records online, talking about the cables of communication about releasing Miss Stone and uh, getting that money over to, to the, um, the Macedonian rebels. So really interesting story. Um, it was in the spring of uh, 1901, I believe, that she was kidnapped. Um, it's also kind of an anniversary that's coming up. Um, I have uploaded, I found a link to the movie. I'm going to be sharing it with you. I actually can't access it here just because I'm on my work computer. I'm going to show you a little clip. Um, just a, a brief little one. You won't be able to hear anything, but you'll be able to kind of see what's uh, cool about it. Um, and um, let's pull it up really quickly. So I didn't spoil anything for you, but um, one of the kidnapped there, um, they did have a baby there. Um, she was pregnant at the time, and she did have a child while being kidnapped by these Macedonian villagers. So kind of an interesting situation there. But um, why don't I encourage you to check this out? This is Macedonia's first movie ever filmed in color. This is Macedonia's first ever color movie, and it's about the United States' first ever uh, hostage situation. Um, and this movie's from 1958, so that's how long it took us to get color. Phenomenal movie. The link I'm going to send you has English subtitles. So um, you really don't have an excuse not to watch it. It's a great movie, very family friendly, very accessible. A lot of great actors. Your parents might know them more so uh, than you, but um, you see a lot of the same actors actually from these movies. So the man playing Gota Dolchev, he's also in that Soul and Assassins movie. One of the main characters in the Soul and Assassins movie, he's in this movie. So 
all intertwined. You're, you're going to start noticing them. And you'll actually know some masculine actors that are definitely worth your time. Okay, so finally, now here's a topic that everybody asks me about. And I'm hesitant to actually talk about it a whole lot, and I'll tell you why. It's about ancient Macedonia. We're all proud of ancient Macedonia. We all love Alexander the Great, Philip, all that. That's phenomenal. However, I'm hesitant to talk about it because while we are related to the ancient Macedonian people, it's a blood relation. I mean, our history, our heritage is so much deeper than that. It's almost confining us in a box. While we do have descent from them, our contributions to world history would be completely hollowed out if we just focused on that. And so this should just be another portion of our history. I mean, I would venture that Alexander the Great is no greater than St. Cyril and Methodius, who quite literally created an alphabet and a language for the entire Slavic-speaking world to this day. Now, for all the greatness of the ancient Macedonians and Alexander the Great, they didn't really care about Macedonia. It was them their own conquest, their own ego. There are 16 cities in, out, in the world named after Alexander, one of which named after his horse. How cool would it have been if there was a place in Afghanistan called New Macedonia that still existed today? It doesn't exist. It wasn't about that. They weren't so much representatives of their people as they were their own egoism and, honestly, their own pragmatism. That's why they started speaking Greek eventually and abandoned the Macedonian language. It's politics. Now, the average Macedonian, sure, I'll be proud of them, but the kings and the aristocrats, kind of hit and miss for me. Much greater people to be proud of. But still, it's part of our history. You should definitely know about it. So here's a great um, video that I do want you to check out. I actually just uploaded. Um, it's a channel I do like uh, watching. Um, it's an animated video. It's not, not with actors. It's about um, 12 minutes long. It's animated. Very, very fresh, crisp, great animation style, great production value. And what I want you to take away with it is we really don't know too much about who the original Macedonian people were. We're pretty sure they weren't Greek because they're absent from most um, archaeological records from the time period of what defined to be Greek, such as the Homeric uh, Trojan War. We don't know too much. So the more we spend time thinking about it, I mean, we'll be missing the forest of the trees. There's so much greater uh, material out there, greater substance to focus on um, that I don't want you to be on Twitter making debates with Greeks over this. This is our history. This is the portion Greeks want to focus on. That little period in which we happen to speak the Greek language as a form of politics and pragmatism. This is our whole history. This is what the Greeks want to focus on. They claim 4,000 years of Greek history. Why are they only focusing on like 8% of it during the time period of ancient Macedonians? So what I'm saying with that is don't fall into their trap. Know enough to be dangerous, but move on as well. So let me show you a quick video here and I'll show you what I mean. And no, this is not about Alexander. You'll see what I mean exactly. So pretty cool. You saw the Macedonian sun there. Don't freak out when he said uh, Macedonia was ruled over by Greeks. You'll understand the context of that. Basically, the kings wanted to be accepted as Greeks. That's why they started speaking Greek. And the Greeks were like, okay, you're not fully Greek, but you're not really barbarian. We'll say the, the kings are maybe somewhat Greek, but the people aren't. So that's why they said Macedonia was a kingdom ruled by Greeks over Macedonians. So politics, very messy. This really does a good job of kind of explaining why it was so messy. And what's cool about it, it's actually about the time before Alexander, before Philip, what was actually happening in Macedonia. And of course, did you catch that little reference to the traditionally xenophobic Greeks? Some traditions, um, they last quite a bit. That's all I'm going to say about that. So great video. Uh, do check it out. Um, like I said, know enough to be dangerous. Do not waste your time with it. It's a trap. It's a trap the Greeks. That's the only thing they talk about. 4,000 years of history, they can only talk about Alexander. So um, do move on. Now, another quick link that I do want you to check out, and uh, we're still good on time here. Um, this is actually uploaded by the Canadian Macedonian Historical Society. 
it's a documentary from the I believe the late to early 80s um, talking about the excavations of Kutnesh, uh, known by Greeks as Vergina, known in ancient times as Aigai. So this was the uh, place where King Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, was buried, where he was found. They found an entire civilization, quite literally, underneath their footsteps. And this is also where the Macedonian sun was discovered, this beautiful symbol. It's not on Zoom yet, so I'm going to be writing to Zoom to get this little background there. So kind of have to make do the old Balkan style here, so that's all right. But um, what's cool about this documentary is twofold. First of all, you see that the, the Macedonians weren't these, you know, <laughs> barbarians uh, living up in the mountains, throwing rocks at each other and, you know, scratching their armpits, not knowing how to speak. They were actually a very sophisticated people with a very unique culture of their own that arguably wasn't Greek. And you see that sophistication, the beauty, the artistry, the relics, exactly what's happening there, distinctly Macedonian. However, the man that discovered this was a man, I was a Greek archaeologist by the name of Manolis Andronikos. And this is at a time period when Macedonia was still under Yugoslavia. So the Greeks weren't all that, let's say, obsessed with proving that Macedonia was Greek. At this time period, they mostly assumed it wasn't. They knew that they were on the territory of the Macedonians, but for them, the Macedonian people were gone. They were disappeared. Their claim to them was pretty much on the territory. And you're able to see through the words of the Greeks themselves, they did not consider Macedonians to be A, their own people, or B, something to be proud of. They considered them people that had conquered Greece, that were foreigners, occupiers, like the Romans, like the Turks, Macedonians as well. So create video to show the shift that happened between 70s, 80s Greece and modern day Greece. Because when they saw that Macedonia was going to be independent, they knew it was inevitable. What did they do? They turned the tables and became the victim. They said, this is Macedonia, that's Skopje. We're Macedonians, they're not, we're the victim. They laid their cards before anything ever happened. Arguably, brilliant move, but that wasn't the case. If you go to Macedonia, if you go to Greece before the late 80s, go to the airport, now called Macedonia, back then was called Airport of Northern Greece. You entered Greece, it didn't say, welcome to Macedonia, it said, welcome to Greece. They knew it was called Macedonia once, but that wasn't discussed. So great video on that perspective. So let me just pull it up for you here. And uh, we'll be done after that, actually. So I uh, just kind of want to show you. It's a little bit of old quality, but that's all right. Nothing, nothing wrong with a little age. Um, I'll just pull it up really quickly. Sorry, I have an ad here. I'm not cool enough to do ad block. Right there. Let me just show you something about you know our ancestors and what they contributed. I know you couldn't hear that, but he actually said he spread Macedonian power all across Asia. So great little documentary. It's about an hour long. And um, what I want you to take away from that is the Greek shift in their perspective. It wasn't always Macedonia was Greek, is Greek, and always will be Greek. It was that unmentionable M word. Unfortunately for the Greeks, though, the other M word, Mario, is going to keep making these videos. So I'm their worst nightmare. So are you. So let's keep the momentum going. It's a pleasure speaking with you and to my fans that are watching online. Two things. Keep yourself safe. Obviously, we don't need any heroes right now. Stay safe. Do your work online. Read. Be dangerous in terms of your knowledge. And like I said, um, mastering history has been replete with lack of organization, lack of funding. Do your part today. Donate when you can to your local church. Donate to UMD. Donate to the organizations that are making an impact in your community, making an impact in your diaspora. You'll know the history now. Once you do, you'll have no excuse not to take action. And no excuse to keep making the same mistakes our ancestors kept making. History is only important if we're able to learn from it. So with that, I bid you farewell. I'm going to see you again soon. Take care. Let's open the floor to some questions. Wait a minute, Mario. We have a question, actually. Um, and thank you very much for, for uh, your excellent presentation. Yeah.
in and for these 10 uh, uh, books, um, uh, websites, um, as well as YouTube uh, films. And uh, we definitely inserted them in the chat and we can definitely circulate those to everybody that signed yeah. up sites. Um, virtual hour, however, Maria um, said uh, that uh, this webinar has been so valuable. Thank you for providing so many resources. You mentioned uh, Cyril and, and Methodi. Do you have any recommendations on any resources for them? Mm, great question, Maria. And thank you for your uh, kind words. Um, glad you did make it. Um, I would honestly start with uh, with this book. There's a whole chapter here about exactly um, kind of what they did. There's a resource online too called um, The Life of Cyril, which is actually pretty interesting. And just a little side note, what's interesting about the brothers uh, Cyril Methodius, back then because there were so few books, you could actually visibly read every single book in existence. So when St. Cyril was called the philosopher, that basically meant he had read every book in existence and he spoke all the, all the known uh, you know, sacred languages and he was a real formidable man. So very, very interesting uh, topic there. I would start with that book. Um, and there's some good resources online as well. Um, I can point you in the right direction. Start with that book, see how you feel about it, and uh, get the setting more so than anything, why they were so important and why they were needed. And uh, message me, I'm always available. I can give you more resources. Um, well, and we just posted the uh, Amazon link to Kindle paperback, um, as well as hardcover for the book. And so if anybody good. wants to, Feel free to click on the link. We'll send you all of this um, in a in an email um, for sure after this. And so, uh, with that, uh, we want to thank uh, everybody for participating um, uh, tonight. Um, we have three more uh, Mario's history talks um, coming up. One on April fifteenth, called Macedonians in the Pages of the Bible. On April twenty second, the Prince of Pirin, the life of Yanis Sandunsky. And on April 29th, Wikipedia Warriors, the new front lines in the battle for Macedonia. Um, so please definitely, um, uh, if you have an RSVP for those, please do. We'll send you the link. Each um, event is at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. And so with that, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you very much, Mario, uh, for these great uh, presentations that today and the next three and i know that we're going to be working on several more after Absolutely. after that because it seems like this quarantine is going to be going on uh for quite some time so of uh, uh, umd and generation m thank you all and have a wonderful uh, uh evening Pozdrav.